And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel Rhodes, who is our horticulture educator for Queen Anne's County. And she's gonna talk about uh, the vegetables and herbs. Hey everybody. All right. Did you know that buying seeds and plants is a gateway to gardening? The thrill of walking through a nursery, home and garden store, or even a hardware store and picking out a new variety or seeing those artful seed packets offers your brain a rush of a for euphoria, excitement, and instant gratification. Only for you to get home and realize that you already have a crisper drawer full of seed packets from last year. Well, folks, I'm here to serve as your seed saleswoman for interesting and unique vegetables and herbs that you can grow. Like Emily said, my name is Rachel Rhodes, and I am the Master Gardener Coordinator and Horticulture Educator for the University of Maryland Extension in Queen Anne's County. Before we get started, I'd like to bring your attention to this poster. It is a direct message from our federal funder who wants to be sure that you know you have the right to access our program and any accommodation if necessary. If you have any questions or concerns, we hope you will let us know. And this poster lets you know how you can contact the federal government directly as well. So I hope I, with this talk, that I introduce you to some unique and interesting vegetables and herbs that you can incorporate in your garden. And this is, talk is more for the novice gardener who would like to transition into some unique and interesting vegetables and herbs. I always like to start every year growing a new variety or um, interesting vegetable or herb into my garden and seeing how it goes. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the globe artichoke. They are a perennial heirloom vegetable known for their tendal, tender edible pine cone pine cone like flower buds. They have large silvery green leaves reaching up to about five foot tall and they have a very large spread of about three foot wide. There are more than 140 artichoke varieties, but less than 40 are grown commercially today. France, Italy, and Spain cultivate a majority of the crop. However, in the US, 100% of our artichokes are grown in California. In California, the plants are maintained for about five to 10 years, but here in Maryland in zone seven, we typically grow them as an annual versus a perennial. They're best planted in the fall if you were in zones 10 to 11 where you have frost-free areas. If you were like me and you love the history that goes along with plants, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the history of plants in this talk, um, research the history and legend of artichokes. It really doesn't disappoint and you can go down a rabbit hole and spend probably about three hours learning about the history of an artichoke. So what do we know about an artichoke? We know that it's a perennial and it's also native to the Mediterranean. And what do we know about Mediterranean plants? They like it hot and they like it dry. Although because this plant is massive, it will require irrigation and feeding throughout the summer. Artichoke seeds should be started in February and they're taproot plants. So you need to start them in containers that are larger than your normal 50 cell tray. So probably like a four inch by four inch pot. If you haven't started them, don't fear. Many of our home and garden stores carry them as transplants. So look for them in mid-May. Artichokes, because they are a Mediterranean plant, really thrive in full sun, but will tolerate partial shade in the afternoon. And they need well-drained light soil. So sandy or loamy soil is ideal. And they do have a taproot, like I mentioned earlier. So it isn't ideal to put them in, in a container. They do need a large space, unless you have a very, very large container. And you'll need to space them about four foot apart because they get very big. When it's time to harvest, the pine cone like bud will be tight and firm. And it'll hopefully be at about a three inch diameter, like you see these purple globe artichokes right here. And you'll need a very sharp knife to remove the bud from the plant. And it's easiest to do if you leave about a two to three inch stem below the bud and cut it off that way. The made bud will be the largest, but the side buds will be smaller and equally delicious. If the flower is forming like the picture to the right, it's too late 
and let it bloom. These, the interesting thing about the, this plant specifically, it works well as just a really unique plant in your perennial bed or in your vegetable bed because they have such a unique flower and the pollinators absolutely love this plant if you just want to try it as a perennial plant, but it does need a lot of space. Feast your eyes on this stunning multicolored variety of corn that has taken Facebook and the blogosphere by, spore, by storm. It has opulent, opulent kernels glimmering like rare jewels, and it's really easy to see what the buzz is about. Like many heirloom treasures, glass gem corn has a name, a place, and a story. And like I mentioned a couple of slides ago, I love the history of plants. This corn traces back to Carol, Carl Barnes. He was a part Cherokee farmer living in Oklahoma, and he had an uncanny knack for breeding corn. More specifically, he excelled at selecting and saving seeds from cobs that exhibited vivid and translucent colors. Exactly how long he worked on glass glass gem and how many seasons he carefully chose and saved and replanted these special seeds is unknown. But after many years and his painstaking efforts, he created this wonderful cultivar and it has captivated thousands of people around the world. The demand is very high for this rare variety and supplies are limited and vary according to the season. So if you can find this in your local garden store or even online, buy it. The growing conditions for glass gem, it does require full sun and it sprouts relatively quickly with, ger with a germination rate of about seven to 10 days. The ideal planting depth is about one to two inches and the spacing in rows that are 30 inches apart and the distance between rows should be anywhere from 12 to 16 inches. On average, the corn only grows to about four foot to five foot high. Um, it is not frost tolerant, so it's best sown directly in the soil. Succession planting also prolongs the harvest and planting in blocks will improve pollination because corn is pollinated through the wind. Also a disclaimer, if you live in an area where there's field corn present or sweet corn, you need to make sure that you're about 250 foot from that corn so that you don't have any cross contamination or cross pollination. It, when you go to harvest this corn, you wanna make sure that the husks are dry and brown to harvest. And when the husks are ready, the corn will actually drop down. You'll see the, the ear not stand upright anymore and it will just flop down. That's when corn is, dry corn is ready to harvest. This is not only amazing decorative corn, but it is edible and you can grind it into cornmeal or you can save it for popcorn. This is one of my absolute favorites to grow. Leek is a hardy biennial plant in the amaryllis family. And leeks are an ancient crop native to, to the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. The plant is related to the onion and has a mild, sweet onion-like flavor. It was on the menu for Egyptians and the later Romans. And then it was, it's been used for pioneers, for feasts and cuisines. During the Middle Ages, the cultivation of leeks was introduced to Europe, where it remains a prized vegetable to this day. It also appears on the national emblem of Wales and is the country's national vegetable. This is another one that you could go down a rabbit hole with and it doesn't disappoint. The cultivation of leeks spread to North America with the arrival of the first settlers, both as a vegetable and as a condiment, the leek has an enhanced and wide variety of dishes with a unique aroma. It's one that I always add to soups and stews. Leeks are a cool weather crop and their ideal growing temperature ranges from about 55 degrees to 75 degrees. Like collard greens, they appreciate a frost or two and get better with flavor. Most varieties are hardy to zones seven or eight, though some types can tolerate cold weather better. So for Maryland, if you're in Maryland or in zone seven, it might be better to plant this one in the fall. And so that it has a couple of hard frost um, before you harvest it. And there are basic 
there are basically two varieties of leaks, an early season and then a late season. The early season leaks reach maturity at about 50 to 100 days after planting, and then the late season leaks reach maturity at about 120 days to 180 days. And when we say reach maturity, that is really dependent on environmental conditions, soil temperature, and germination rate. They will need full sun to grow. They can grow in a container, raise better in the ground. They are really heavy feeders, so they need a nutrient-rich, well-drained soil, and they also require steady moisture, so a ho soaker hose would be a necessary addition if you are going to grow these beautiful plants. I feel like loofah is one of those that you could say tomato or tomato. There's so many different spellings of loofah. Um, this vegetable is called um, loofah, vegetable sponge, sponge gourd, rag gourd, and there are seven species of annual climbing vines in the gourd family. This is native to old world tropics. Two species are commonly grown for their fruits, which are edible when young. So when they're like between three to five inches, that's that's the, the size that you would want to um, harvest for edible. Or they can be dried for um, using as their sponge. It's a heavy, easy, heavy bearing carefree vine. And these gourds can reach anywhere from six inches to two and a half foot long. And they get from either four, between four to seven inches in diameter. They ripen to a dark green in late summer and then should be left on the vine until the skin begins to shrivel. When this occurs, harvest them and scrub the skin away. We're revealing the porous dense network of tan colored matter within. They will be full of seeds. So you can cut the gourd to the desired side, size and shake out the seeds, save the seeds for next year, give them to friends if they're dry, and then it'll be ready to use. You can plant these directly in the ground after um, the chance of frost and they germinate very quickly within about seven to 10 days. They do per prefer full sun um, and the vining is significant. So if you don't have, um, space, make sure that you put them on a trellis like you um, see here. This is at, I can't believe I've, I haven't said this is my absolute favorite. Maybe I have Emily, I catch me on it uh, because I usually say every vegetable is my favorite. <laughs> In the cucumber world, small is the new big. This one inch fruit looks like a tiny little watermelon that a mouse would lug home from the market. And that's what I see every time I see these. I see like a Beatrice Potter little mouse carrying a wheelbarrow full of these home. Um, the Mexican sour gherkin has many names like coca melon or mouse melon, but this adorable vining plant is neither cucumber nor melon, although most of us will identify it as one or the other. This is part of a larger um, cube cucumber family, and the plant has long medicinal and color and culinary history in Mexico and Central America where they are native. They're now considered re rediscovered open pollinated heirloom plants in North America. So like the loofah, you'll want to maximize your growing space by growing these pretty little um, gherkins on a trellis. They do require full sun with well-drained soil. They like slightly acidic soil, um, so about a 5.5 pH or so. And they are, because they are a tropical plant, they are frost sensitive. Why are they perfect for Maryland? They thrive in high humidity levels. And we know that we have high humidity levels here. So harvesting is kind of a art with these, these <laughs> beautiful little melons. When they are no longer than one inch in diameter, about the size of an olive or grape, but still firm, that's when they should be harvested. And when you see the plant beginning to flower, you need to start checking them every day because they will get big really quickly um, and make sure it, it flowering usually happens around the germination mark or around six, the 60 day mark after planting. I've always found that it's better to cut them from the vine versus pulling because they are they, it is a tender vine and pulling can really damage that vine. 
So what can you do with them? You can eat them right off the vine. They're really good for salads or additions to salsa if you like to make homemade salsa. I've even pickled these, which is amazing. Love them pickled. I like to pickle a lot of things. So this just adds to my repertoire. Something else I like to pickle, okra. <laughs> so okra, um, known to many English speaking countries as lady fingers. Um, and you can tell by the flower of this plant, it's a member of the mallow family. Okra probably originated somewhere around Ethiopia and was cultivated, cultivated by ancient Egyptians around the 12th century BC. Its cultivation spread throughout North Africa and the Middle East and the seed pods were eaten, cooked, and they were toasted or ground or even used as a coffee substitute. And they still are used as a coffee substitute. Okra came to the Caribbean and the US in the 1700s, probably bought, brought by slaves from West Africa and introduced to Western Europe soon after that. In Louisiana, um, okra was used to thicken gumbo and soups and now is an essential um, ingredient in gumbo. Because okra germinates best when planted in the soil that is warmer than 80 degrees, you wanna make sure that you start the seeds in flats and transplant the seedlings when the weather has war warmed up. So for us, you could start the seedlings now indoors. Um, just make sure that you have a germination mat to keep them kind of warm, or you can start them on top of your refri refrigerator too, as long as it's a warm space. They do grow really quickly um, and they would be ready to put out um, probably mid-May. A little caveat about starting them from seeds if you can't find the plants is that they do um, like to have that seed coat nicked a little bit or um, scratched up with some sandpaper. If you don't have sandpaper or anything like that, you could always put them in a plastic baggie with some sand and a moist paper towel that will do the job as well. So with okra, you can do one of two things. You can harvest the pods when they are young and immature like probably less than six inches. I like to harvest mine when they're in that four to five inch range. They're a little bit more tender um, at that point. And, or you could let them dry on the plant and then use them in um, flower arrangements because they, they dry beautifully. Um, in order to harvest them, you do want to use either your pruning shears or a sharp knife because it is a pretty tough plant. They really store well in the refrigerator. Um, so after you harvest them, you are going to want to refrigerate them. They can be cooked and used in stews or gumbos or even fried as a side dish. You can also pickle them. I love to make um, sweet and spicy pickled okra. It's absolutely delicious. So next, one of my other favorites, purple potted pole beans. The purple potted pole, pole bean is an heirloom um, bean found in the Ozark Mountains around 1930. Um, and it dates back to much longer than that and was probably brought to America by European immigrants. This bean has six foot long vines and it usually can get a little over, hand, little over that. So you wanna make sure that you have a trellis. Um, and then the bean, as you can see, can get about six to seven inches long. The plants will have, like the name suggests, the plants will have a purple hue and the beans will have a purple hue. You want to make sure that you plant these beans after the danger of frost has passed, then the soil has warmed up to a depth about six inches. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a pole bean, so it needs to be planted in hills or on a trellis or have a trellis system. And you can make your own trellis system by using some bamboo poles, some wire or even um, some fiber and train those vines to grow up. Um, this is a perfect plant for the Three Sisters Garden. And you can, eat, you can also put them in a container if you have limited space, as long as you have a trellis system. Um, an interesting thing about this plant is that after you cook them, they will no longer be purple. So this is like the perfect addition to a children's um, 
garden because they love to see the purple flowers and then the hue of the purple leaves and then the purple beans but when you cook them they do turn green it's a really cool science experiment um so they will need full sun to grow and the one thing about beans is when they when our temperatures rise above 80 degrees they'll stop producing pods um so green beans flowering hot weather can experience blossom drop um, if our temperatures get up pretty high. And you'll see this with a lot of people when they have problems growing lima beans. It's usually around that time in July and August when our nighttime temperatures get up above 80 degrees. Um, so if, if you're worried about that in your zone, you can plant them in full sun, make sure they have full sun during the height of the afternoon and then get some shade. They do prefer well-drained nutrient soil, nutrient-rich soil, because they are pretty heavy feeders. Pennsylvania Dutch Crookneck Squash. I was introduced to this plant by one of my master gardeners, and I absolutely love it now, and it is a staple in my garden. Um, this squash is a popular squash grown and used by the Pennsylvania Dutch community since the 19th century. The first mention of the winter crookneck resembling the lengthy Dutch crookneck was in writings dating back to 1749 by Peter Kahn, a student of Carl Linnaeus, who traveled the Americas cataloging pumpkins. The Dutch crookneck squash is a variety that has long been, long been properly, popularly grown by American Amish in Pennsylvania, and it is excellent for pumpkin butter, pumpkin pie, or even just baked in the oven. It is oh, such a good squash. This is a gorgeous and enormous squash. It weighs between 10 to 20 pounds if the soil conditions are right. And it's one of the largest long to neck squashes in existence. Um, it will absolutely take over a garden. So you need to make sure that you have space. It's very easy to prepare since the seeds are all contained at the bottom of the bulb. And when you're um, harvesting, you just wait for the, the little um, vine at the end to die and just pop it right off. Be like I said, this absolutely needs a lot of space. Um, you sow the seeds outdoors when the danger of frost has passed, usually mid-May for us, and the hills should be spaced 12 inches apart or six foot apart in all directions. So one seed would be enough for one gar gardener. And you know that when we buy seeds, we don't just get one seed. We usually get a packet full of seeds. Um, but one to two plants will do you just fine because they are huge. Um, and the vining can trail for about eight foot or more. They do require full sun. And like any good squash, the seeds germinate seven to 10 days after planting. And their maturity is at about 120 days. And like I've said before, maturity can, dep can vary depending on soil conditions and the temperature. And this is a very good, easy squash to store in the winter if you have a nice cool dry area. So the purple majesty potato um, has a deep rooted history in South America, originally native to Peru and Bol Bolivia. It can easily be found at many home and garden stores or even online today. It has been valued as a food for the god for centuries because of its excellent source of vitamin C, B6, potassium, and um, it's anti antioxidant um, immune booster. For this reason alone, Spanish sailors gathered and used its tubers in long voyages to um, discourage scurvy. This is my new addition for this year. I always, like I said, I always try to have one new addition in my garden. <clears throat> and these are really kind of tiny potatoes when you think about. Um, you know, like our russet or our Yukon golds, they're smaller. They're probably about uh, two inch in diameter, a nice small potato. And they mature in about 85 to 
days, they require full sun and will spread about 15 inches. So you, you do need space for them to grow. Hi, however, they are ideal for a trash can potato if you have limited space. And this is an easy, easy way to grow potatoes if you haven't done it before. You just take a trash can and drill holes in the bottom. If, if you don't have holes, the potatoes are gonna rot. And then layer about 10 inches of potting mix into the trash can. Prepare your potatoes by for planting by cutting the potatoes um, into a smaller section when you have an eye. So here you can see I've cut the potatoes. So they have about three to four eyes in each section. Each eye will turn into a plant. So when you're ready to plant your potatoes, bury the seeds, the seed potatoes about four inches under the potting mix and place the garbage can in an area that receives full direct sunlight. Add more potting mix as the plants grow. And this is called mounding. When the potato starts to grow, you could, should continually add potting mix to cover up the plant stems, and but make sure that the leaves are exposed to the sun. This allows for more room under the soil for new potatoes to grow. And when you're, um, I'm sorry, let's go back. When you're ready to harvest those potatoes, you're just gonna dump out your trash can on a tarp and pick through your potatoes. So it's a little bit less intensive than you know traditionally putting them in the ground and then having to um, get those potatoes out with a, a rake. So I could not mention rhubarb. Um, rhubarb is a perennial hardy vegetable that can easily grow for about 10 years or more with the right care. It's in the buckwheat family and has a sour flavor and is among the first crops ready for harvest in the spring. This plant is native to China and was grown and traded for medicinal purposes as early as the 16th century. It suffers from almost no pest and is incredibly easy to grow. It is a cold weather plant and our zone seven is about as far south as it will tolerate. You'll want to plant one year old rhubarb crowns, which you can find at a garden center, nursery, or you can even order them online. The plants will be sold as a bare root specimen mixed with peat moss, shredded paper, or coconut courier. Some garden centers will have rhubarb already planted and growing in pots ready for transplanting. And rhubarb can be grown from seed, but it's not recommended because it takes several years for the plants to become mature enough to produce a good harvest. It can be planted in late spring or early fall. I mean, early spring, early fall. I'm sorry about that. Established plants do need to be divided every five to 10 years and always divide when the plants are dormant. So that would be early spring or late fall. They really need well-drained soil with ample space because the clumps can grow to about three foot to five foot wide. They are a very heavy feeder, so they do need annual compost. Um, when they are ready to harvest, they should be about 12 to 18 inches long. And you want to simply either twist the, the stem and pull it up or you can use a sharp knife and cut those with a cut those at the base, but try not to damage the crown. Early spring stems are the most tender and are perfect ad additions to pies. There's a re there's a reason why we call it strawberry and rhubarb pie. They are ready at the same time and they pair very very well together. Stems that are harvested later in the season tend to be tougher, but are good additions to savory stews, sauces, or even making jam. Mature plants will offer about eight to 10 weeks of harvesting season. In general, one mature plant can provide two to three pounds of stalks, which is a very large amount when you're thinking about um, a vegetable garden. Important facts about rhubarb, the leaves attached to the rhubarb stalk are poisonous, so we do not eat those. And they contain oxalate acid, which in high doses can lead to hyperoxaluria. And in short, it's an accumulation of, of oxalate passing through the urine and will lead to kidney stones and eventually kidney failure. Other symptoms that will, will appear are vomiting and diarrhea, and they usually resolve in a few hours. But it's important to note that poisoning from the leaves is very rare, and a person would need to eat between almost five and a half 
to almost 12 pounds of rhubarb leaves to have that potential toxic dose, but that also is dependent on the concentration of oxalate in the leaves. So make sure that when you're harvesting, you are not eating the leaves just to be safe. So I, I've, I've talked about two corns. This would be my second corn. And this one is a cute, adorable little popcorn that I've seen a lot this year. And I cannot wait to put it in um, my garden. This, this is an ideal garden plant for a children's garden or small garden due to its small stature and uniqueness. Um, strawberry popcorn is absolutely adorable. And when it dries, each kernel is dark garnet in color and they're slightly pointy. It can be used as a popcorn because, but because the um, kernels are so small, it may be a challenge for you to take it off the cob, but it can also be ground into cornmeal or flour or even polenta. The growing conditions, it, it's a corn, so it needs full sun so directly in the soil and it will germinate in about seven to 10 days. Mature height is only five to six feet and the fruit size is only two to three inches. So that's pretty small when you're thinking about a ear of corn. Trigger warning, and I mentioned this with glass gem corn, um, you really wanna prevent cross pollination. So if you're gonna grow um, a, a unique variety of corn, pick one or the other. Um, unless you have the space to plant both, both varieties and you'll wanna make sure that you are with, in that 250 foot range between both varieties. If you're interested in learning about how to save your corn seed and to prevent cross contaminate or cross pollination, um, Seed Savers has an awesome tutorial on hand pollinating corn and preventing cross um, pollination. It's a really great video that you can look up. You just Google seed savers and um, hand pollinating corn. So next up, we're going to talk about herbs. Um, and I want to make sure that I do a little disclaimer. And please remember that the medicinal uses of these herbs and the use of supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And for this reason, it's best to purchase products that have been tested um, for quality by a third party. And finally, if you're taking any medications or have underlying health conditions, be sure to talk with your healthcare professional before taking herbs for medicinal uses or supplements or ingesting certain herbs because they have, can have contraindications with medications. Anise hyssop is a short-lived herbaceous perennial with blue flowers and fragrant foliage that can be used as an ornamental or in an herb garden. This plant is part of the mint family, Laminaceae, and is hardy in zones three to eight. Like catnip and mint, Anna hyssop has, anise hyssop has square stems. The aromatic, leaf, aromatic leaves have a licorice-like scent and are used in herbal teas to flame, flavor jellies or eaten fresh in small quantities, such as a salad with other greens. Another bonus to this beautiful plant is Hyssop is a pollinator plant. In fact, it has been identified by the Xerces Society as one of the top plants for pollinators. Bees especially love this plant. And for me, I love to watch bumblebees as they try to fit their fat little bottoms into these tubular flowers. And if you have a small patch, you will see so many different bees just buzzing all around it. It's just, it's a great pollinator plant. There are many cultivars of this plant, but I found that the straight species is less fussy about the soil requirements. They do require well-drained soil and full sun to partial shade. And once established, it's drought tolerant. It gets about two to four foot tall and it can spread because it does have a small taproot and spreads by rhizomes. It's part of the mint family. So if you want it contained, put it in a container. Um, and the fun fact, who here has a problem with deer on their property? Deer do not like this plant. They won't go anywhere near it. But I've seen some rabbits find this incredibly tasty, but the deer will stay away. So if you have plants that you want to protect, put a little container of hyssop near it. Bay leaf for bay laurel is one of the most widespread aromatic herbs grown and as a member of the Laurier family, 
This is an evergreen tree that is native to the Mediterranean region, and the leaves are often used in Medita Mediterranean recipes. Bay laurel is considered a sacred plant to the Greeks and Romans, and the trees were often planted near temples, and the foliage was burned during um, various rites. This herb adds robust flavor to soups and stews and has long been used as a seasoning for cooking. This is a tree, so it's best hardy in zones eight to 10. It's a Mediterranean plant, so it's gonna like it a little bit warmer than we have here. Um, so if you're growing it outside, plant it in full sun to partial shade and the leaves can't survive temperatures below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you live in a in the northern part of um, zone seven, consider planting your trees in a container so you can bring it inside during warmer months. If you're gonna put it in a con container uh, and grow it indoors, it will need bright light and occasional misting to keep it, the humidity levels as the plant likes it. Um, you could even add a little humidifier near it to help. And I always do that in the winter anyway with my house plants because it gets dry, you know, all houses are dry in the winter. If you're moving this plant in, if you have it in a container and you're moving it inside and outside from summer to winter, you'll need to make sure that you inspect it properly for hitchhikers during the move and possibly quarantine it so that you don't bring any unwanted pests into your home and contaminate your house plants. Bay trees are dioecious, which means that they have both male and female plants that are needed to produce seeds. And the seeds form on the female plants and are contained inside the berries that form in the fall. As a side note, um, the raw leaves and flowers are toxic to cats, dogs, and horses. The toxic principal stem from eugenol, which and other essential um, oils in the bay laurel. And as noted by the ASP, ASPCA, it filters through the liver and can possibly cause liver damage and to the surrounding cells and tissues and depress their central nervous system. So you, if you have this in a container or if you have it um, planted outside, you may want to limit their access. The leaves are, if you've ever um, bought bay leaves, you'll know that they are very pointy and sharp. So if your pet has eaten one of these, then um, they'll, they can also damage their esophagus just because of how sharp they are. Um, but if you think that your pet has ingested one of these, you want to automatically contact your veterinarian. Bee balm is one of my favorites. Um, and I love to grow this every year. So we have Monarda didyma and Monarda fistulosa. Monar Monarda didyma is red bee balm, and then fistulosa has pink, lavender, whitish flowers. And this plant has several common names from Monarda to Bergamot to Oswego tea. Each common name is distinguishable to its main properties. This is a popular perennial plant and holds a special place in my midsummer garden with its bright red scarlet flowers. As the name suggests, it's favored by pollinators um, and it's highly attractive to hummingbirds as well. It grows really good in zones four to seven and does best with rich soil with high organic matter that provides moisture during our hot dry summers. So moist, rich soil. It does like to have partial shade to, and it grows to about three to five foot tall. I have found with growing bee balm, the more sun it has, the, the worse it does. So it really likes to have that morning sun and afternoon shade. It blooms from June to August. In addition to being a beautiful pollinator plant, bee balm has many useful herbal properties. Its main uses include antiseptic, teas to soothe, soothe fevers, headaches, and stomach aches. The main herbal properties of bee balm stem from its antimicrobial effects. All parts of the plant are essential um, to treating digestive issues as the plant has properties that combat the buildup of gas in the body. Additionally, the plant acts as a diuretic, which can soothe digestive problems, and it can um, be used to reduce fevers. This herb is a member of the mint family as well. So the leaves of bee balm 
have a slightly minty flavor and you can use it as, as a tea as well. You just wanna make sure that you're selecting leaves that do not have any type of um, downy mildew. Like you can see right here, I have some, uh, have some mildew growing on this one. And that's a pretty common problem with bee balm because of our humidity levels here. And you know, it likes to be in the shade. The genus of borage includes three species that are native to the Mediterranean region and Europe. Historically, people used borage to treat melancholy or a case of the blahs, although this quote unquote cure was often created by mixing borage, the stems, the leaves, the flowers with alcohol. So was it really the plant that cured the blahs or the alcohol? We'll never know. There are many potential health benefits with borage and ha it has a long prized history. However, there are several side effects that need to be considered when consuming this plant. In traditional medicine, borage has been used to dilate blood vessels or treat heart conditions as a sedative. It's been used to treat seizures. Both the leaves and flowers are edible and used as a garnish or dried with vegetables or even in drinks. Meanwhile, the seeds were used to make borage oil which is a, has been applied to treat skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis. However, with borage specifically, in some incidences, bor borage oil has been shown to cause serious side effects, including seizures. Borage tastes like a cucumber and eating borage is said to give you courage. The flowers are this beautiful blue starch shape and is typically grown as an annual. It does best when planted in full sun and it, it's a very small statured plant. It only gets to about two to three foot tall and it really likes moist, well-drained soil. This is a heavy, heavy, heavy reseeder. So it's perfect for a cottage garden. And if you want it contained, make sure you put it in a container. Um, and it usually blooms in June or July. So it's an early bloomer. It's a beautiful plant. This is another one of my favorites. Um, lemongrass. It's a tropical herbaceous perennial herb native to Indian and Thailand, and it's widely used in Asian and Latin American cu cuisine. And lemongrass offers a light citrusy flavor that tastes like lemon, but without the bitter or acidic aftertaste. It's perfect for tea. Love lemongrass tea, and it's a great addition to fish. You can grate a slice. You can grate it or slice it um, when you're using it for tea. A single pot of lemongrass will suffice for most gardeners and your local nurseries um, might not carry it, but check some Asian markets um, that, are, that might be local in your area and you should be able to find it. Lemongrass likes it hot because it's from India and Thailand, right? Right, plate, right plant, right place. So you wanna make sure that you plant it in the spring after frost has passed and it likes to grow in an area with full sun that's fertile. I always plant, I've always had mine in a container and I just move it outside in the summer and bring it back in the winter. Um, and it does really well in a container. You just wanna make sure that if you're planting it in a container, that it's a large container. You can either do a five gallon bucket with some holes drilled in the bottom to make sure that it drains or a container that has at least a 12 inch spread. If you don't put it in a container and plant it directly in the ground. It will act as an ornamental grass, but it will spread a little bit. It's very easy to, to divide and take off a piece and give it to your friend because, um, you know, it, it's pretty, pretty tolerable of that. Um, when it's time to harvest, you wanna make sure that the plant is about 12 inches tall or more and about a half inch wide at the base. And you will need a sharp knife. And I would recommend using your gardening gloves because those blades of grass are very sharp, can hurt your hands very easily. Nigella or black cumin originated from Southeastern Asia. Nigella is a member of the buttercup family and should not be mistaken as a relative of cumin or in the APAC family. This plant has a, an extensive and rich history of, evidence, of uses. Evidence of nigella dates back to 1650 BC at an archeological site in Turkey and was even found in the tomb of King Tut. When growing nigella, it prefers full sun, well-drained soil, and you can plant it by seed in late spring. It grows to about 12 inches in height. After, and what you're looking for with nigella is those seeds. So after germination, 
the seeds, the flowers should form in about two months. And after flowering, a half inch long horn seed pod will form like you see right here. This is the seed head after the flowers have dried and it's been harvested. When the seed pods turn brown, harvest and crush them to release the seeds inside. The seeds are rich in both essential fatty acids. They give a range of benefits and most of these have been seen for healthy digestion, cardiovascular and immune response. They actually say that nigella seeds are better in essential fatty acids than extra virgin olive oil. It also is an anti-inflammatory and an antimicrobial. All right, sassafras. I don't know about you, but sassafras is one of those plants that um, my grandparents always talked about for, by using sassafras roots to make tea. So I absolutely had to add this plant um, into my unique herb. Sassafras is a native plant to North America and was used by Native Americans for, for various medicinal cures and cooking. The Choctaw Indians first used and dried ground leaves as seasoning and thicker. Thick, uh, and as a thickener. In 1578, Sir Walter, Sir Walter Raleigh brought, back, brought it back to England from the Virginia colony, and sassafras was one of the first plants traded by Americans because of its practical uses, and it was discovered to support medical uses as well. Sassafras was touted to cure almost any ailment when used as a tea or a tonic and was a favorite of England. It is an understory plant that grows along woodland edges or in the woods fo following blowdown fires or logging. Sassafras trees will grow in part shade um, to part sun and are soil and are very tolerant they, of many soil conditions. They grow in clay, loam, sand, acidic soils, and provided that there's adequate drainage. If you're going to plant a sassafras tree, remember that it's an understory tree and it needs a protected area. Um, and these are most evident in the fall when they're turning those bright red colors. It can be grown as a shrub um, or small tree depending on the site. So make sure that you plan accordingly. Sassafras oil has been used in making soap and flavoring drinks such as sassafras tea, sarsaparilla, or root beer. There's a big disclaimer here. There are conflicting potential health benefits associated with sassafras versus possible side effects. And these have been subject, have been a subject of controversy for decades. It was discovered that sassafras oil was a tasty chemical or a tasty, tasty product, but it also contains a compound called saffron. In the 1960s, the Food and Drug Administration banned saffrons as an additive after it was found to cause liver cancer in rats and miscarriages in humans. In the 1970, the sale of saffron containing sassafras tea was banned. Today, our root beer contains sassafras root. However, it's been treated to remove the oil that came, contains saffron. So if you're going to harvest this or if you're going to harvest the root to make tea, please be forewarned that it has major implications. Spice bush is another great herb. Um, it's known as Benjamin bush, fever bush, or wild ice allspice. This beautiful native shrub is an admirable addition to any home garden that has a wet spot, damp woods, or even a stream bank. The fragrant leaves turn bright gold in the fall and is a wonderful contrast to the red fruits if the birds haven't eaten them already. Spice bush is incredibly common and easily found and harvested for medicinal uses. It has a rich history as an Appalachian herbal medicine. The leaves, buds, and new growth twigs can be made into a tea that is warming and stimulating, helping with both digestion and circulation. Spice bush played a pivotal role in American history during the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. The berries from the plant were dried and crushed and used as a substitute for allspice when trade products were sparse. Soldiers during the Civil War also used the berries, leaves, and trigs as a substitute for coffee because the plants had that stimulating property. If you are going to purchase spice bush, they are an understory shrub that will grow to about 15 foot in height. It's hardy to zone five um, and it grows best in part 
to full shade and it really, really loves to have wet feet. The spice bush flowers appear, appear in early spring. So you'll see them right now blooming and it'll be this beautiful yellow color. Um, and they'll bloom up prior to the leaves. Spice bush is dioecious as well. So that means that you have distinct male and female plants. Females flower, the female flowers are small and yellow with six sepals and no petals. And then the male flowers have nine reddish stamens. And the flowers are clustered in groups of four to six. So if you love forsythia, but want to plant something native, think about spice bush. For uses, as previously mentioned, we use spice bush for brewing teas. Um, we crushed and dried the leaves and dried the berries and seasoned meat. And the teas have a range of medicinal properties, including relief of fatigue, pain, arthritis, fever, and cold symptoms. The oils from the berries can be applied topically to treat bruises and rheumatic pain and is a, can be used as a first aid ointment. As a fun side note to this plant, besides all of these medicinal purposes, one of the things that I love the most about spice bush is the spice bush swallowtail. The caterpillars generally fold the leaves together to form shelter in which they weave with a silk lining and the young caterpillars mimic bird droppings and the older caterpillars have these lovely blue spots that you can see right here and ferocious false ice spots right here. These are absolutely beautiful. And it's believed that the false eye spots are to deter predators. Um, and spice bush swallowtail will feed, spice bush swallowtail caterpillars will feed on sassafras, spice bush, and sweet bay. It's a great little plant to have just for the spice bush caterpillars. Stevia is a member of the Asteraceae family. And if you're looking for an alternative to a calorie-free sweetener, Stevia is the plant for you. This plant is an herbal shrub native to South America, and it's been used for food and medicinal purposes for hundreds of years. And the leaves have been sold as a dietary supplement as well. You can find this in many of your garden stores um, mid-May as, as an herb, and it grows to about one to two foot tall, and it provides, prefers full sun and moist well draining so soil. However, it is not drought tolerant. So if you're planting it in a container, make sure that it stays moist. It is hardy from zones eight to 11. So it is not frost tolerant in our area. And propagation is done best by, seed, by cutting, not seed collection. The leaves are the sweetest in cool temperatures of autumn. And they, they also taste best prior to the plant blooming or flowering. You can dry the leaves and use them at a later time by cutting the stems and stripping the leaves off. And you can place them on loosely woven fabric or non-metal screening outdoors to dry on a sunny day. Or if you have a dehydrator, you can put them in a dehydrator. Once the leaves are crisp, you crush them by hand or you can put them in a food processor to make them in a powder, into a powder and store it in an air airtight container. While the powdered leaves will not dissolve, they're a wonderful way to sweeten your beverage and your foods. Just don't overdo it because they are a pretty powerful sweetener. All right, this is the last one. Vietnamese coriander. Um, and Emily will appreciate this one. If you're like me and you love cilantro, but hate that it bolts so quickly, or do you hate cilantro, but still want to substitute for homemade salsa? I got the plant for you. And Vietnamese coriander is that plant. It's called Vietnamese coriander, Vietnamese cilantro, and it is a heat loving perennial with a slightly spicy flavor um, that is a great substitute for cilantro or even mint. This plant has many, many names, including Vietnamese coriander, Vietnamese cilantro, Cambodian mint, or Ru Ram. It is native to Southeast Asia and has spread throughout Asia because of migrating and people. The purchase, so for growing conditions, um, purchase live plants or propagate from cuttings. It may be difficult to find in our local area, but you can do a quick Google search and you'll get a variety of online vendors. 
It likes full to filtered sunlight and thrives in warmer climates, and it's hardy from zones 9 to 11, but it can be grown here in a container, just as long as you understand that you're not going to have it in the fall or winter. It does prefer constantly moist um, conditions, so you're going to make sure that you plant this in another container with plants that like to be moist. It works well for cooler climates. So um, as long as you make sure that you have it in that container and you can bring it inside. It's ready to harvest when the leaves are fully formed and still tender um, and for continual harvest and to promote fresh dense growth, pinch the tops of the shoot as you harvest. Um, and like I mentioned, it can be used as a substitute for cilantro. You can add it to soups, stews, salads, my favorite uh, is to add this in spring rolls instead of cilantro or when making a banh mi. So to paraphrase, oddballs should be cherished. If they can do something, other vegetables and herbs can't do. So cherish those oddballs and go out and look for them. And that's all I have. Hey, Rachel, that was great. Both Emily and I were kind of going through the chat and um, trying to answer a couple of questions, but um, let me just send you this. Oh, no, it looks like you already have it. Um, yeah. So we've got questions in here. Um, the first one is about um, keeping your seeds in the crisper because oh, you're yeah. keeping your um, seeds in the refrigerator. Yes, this is a method that I use every single year when I buy seeds. I throw them in my crisper, the crisper drawer in your refrigerator. And as long as seeds are kept at a consistent cool temperature, they usually will germinate. Um, I have seeds in my CRISPR from probably 2018 because I have a seed problem. I buy lots of seeds and then Addiction. I forget that I have yep. them. And then mm -hmm. I go and I'm like, oh, I already have five packets of watermelon radishes. Why'd I buy more? <laughs> it happens. Thanks. It's a great way to hang on to seeds for the next year. Um, and and like, as Maya said, she needs a little fridge for her seeds. I have one at the office. It's classified our manure fridge, but it's full of my seeds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fair. I mean, you can't use it for food, so. No. Um, so the next question was actually about where to find artichoke, the plants or seeds. The seeds are really easily available at our home and garden stores. We've kind of missed the plant for, or the, the window, the planting, for, window. For the planting window, because yeah. they do take a little bit longer to germinate. They're almost mm -hmm. on the cusp of a pepper. Um, you know, it takes peppers a long time to germinate. Um, but you can find your plants reg easily in your home and garden stores, especially if you have like a mom and pop home and garden store versus your big box home and garden store. They usually have some unique varieties. So you could or, you know, just go to your home and garden store, your local one and say, hey, what kind of vegetables are you ordering for this year? Are you gonna have this? Usually they're pretty accommodating. When do you start planting glass gem corn? Okay, so that's an important question because um, corn is a tropical plant. So our soil temperatures need to be warmer. Um, I usually wait until June to plant my, um, my glass gem. You can wait till Memorial Day uh, I just kind of feel like in Maryland, our temperatures can be so iffy that you really want to make sure that that soil temperature is above 60 degrees. So does squash vine borer uh, bother loofah? Well, um, squash, I mean, it is a, it's a gourd, so it's in the squash family. Um, so yes, it will bother. Um, or cucumber beetle. I haven't seen cucumber beetle on it before. Doesn't mean it won't happen. But um, I'd be more worried about the, the boar or squash bugs. Okay, so our spring and summer lakes were covered with a small black bug. Um, what can we do to organically eliminate? There is a product called um, Surround, which is basically clay that you can kind of wet down and paint on your leaf that will help. Um, I, and I'm assuming that you probably have flea beetle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have these potatoes um, directions written? Um, I I can share my I can share the presentation with Haley, and it has all of my notes in it. So I'm more than happy with sharing if if everybody wants it shared for the directions. 
Um, when can I put my bay tree back outside? When it's consistently above 60 degrees. So when you're getting, you know, five to 10 days of consistent weather, not this, you know, weird stuff that we have in April and mid-May. So make sure it's warm outside. It is a Mediterranean plant. It likes it warm. How do you start bee balm, bee balm plants? Um, well, I like to get my bee balm from friends, <laughs> but you can start them as seeds. They, they overseed, they reseed very easily. Um, you can get seeds practically at, um, at any local home and garden store. Um, but because they are in the mint family, they do have rhizomes. So if you have a friend that has some bee balm, it's very easy to, you know, dig up a little patch of theirs, or if they're willing to give some away because they're, um, they're, they're a great little plant. So are bee balm, borage, and hyssop plants deer resistant? Um, I, hyssop is deer resistant. I, I'm not so sure about bee balm or borage. Um, I would say that bee balm is probably deer resistant. I haven't, and this is just from my personal expertise. Everybody is going to have a different de deer pressure in their area. So if you don't have other things for them to eat, I'm sure they're going to eat it. You know, I haven't ever seen them eat bee balm, but I'm sh because they prefer my hostas more. And I'm, and I'm not sure about borage. I, I didn't find any information about being deer resistant in my research. How do I tell if my seeds are good if I didn't refrigerate them? Easy, very easy to tell. Um, so if you have um, maybe 10 seeds and you wanna test the germination for them, stick 10 seeds in a wet paper towel in a old blueberry container, you know, that has little vents and let it sit for a few days. If you have seven seeds germinate, so seven seeds have sprouts, then you have a 70% germination rate. Really easy test. Do deer eat glass gem corn? Deer will eat corn. They will eat any variety of corn. <laughs> they don't, they don't differentiate. So yes. Um, and then there's one more. One, the do chat. I need to stake my artichoke plants? Um, I haven't ever had to stake them because they are such hardy perennials. Um, well, annuals for us, but they're pretty hardy. Um, I like to intermix them with my landscaping plants. <laughs> because they're so big um, and they have, and they're so beautiful. Nobody ever really questions me, um, but you shouldn't need to stake them. No. Oh. What is your best soil recipe? Take a soil test first, especially if you haven't grown a garden in a while, or if it's been more than three to five years, do a soil test. Make sure you know what you're working with, that you have the proper pH, that you have the proper nutrients. If your soil test um, it's okie dokie, ready to go. Then I always, um, I always add some of my verma compost in my little holes, or if you need amendments, bagged compost as well, because it is, it has been tested. I don't like to use compost from a friend that says, Hey, I got this great horse manure. I'm not one of those people. I like things that have been tested and proven to be good. Let's see. Can I plant rosemary from cuttings? Oh yeah. That's an easy thing to do. Um, rosemary, thyme, even oregano you can do cuttings from. You just make sure that you have number one, soilless mix and a rooting hormone. And then you take about a six inch piece of rosemary, strip off probably an inch or half an inch of the leaves on the bottom, stick it in your rooting hormone, and then put it in your soilless mix. Easy peasy. Let it water it regularly and it should be it should grow some roots. You can also do just stripping it off, stripping off the leaves at the bottom of the rosemary and sticking it in some water to see if it grows roots that way. Um, that's another easy method. Thyme, I found that thyme is easier to root than rosemary. Um, rosemary can be kind of finicky, but it, it you can do it. What about containers? Um, so Diane, I'm guessing that you're talking about soil recipe for containers. Um, containers, I like to use just plain old potting mix. Um, and I do not reuse potting mix from year to year because as you know, you can have a disease that overwinters in your potting mix. So I like to freshen it out. I'll put that old potting mix 
in my compost and start fresh every year. But usually potting mix has the proper nutrients and mixture of soilless mix and soil for it for things to grow properly. We'll just get a couple more. So um, soilless mix can either be it will say soilless mix on it or seed starting mix. It's usually a mixture of peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite, or you can use coconut coir. And this is a sterile soilless mix. It is not, it doesn't have garden soil in it. It doesn't have potting mix. It doesn't have nutrients. It's used to start seeds in a light, fluffy environment. It's like putting your seeds in a down comforter. So their roots can grow easily. Yes. Yeah. And not dampen all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's everything. Mm -hmm. Questions keep pouring in whenever I think that. So. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, everyone. I hope that I gave you some unique and interesting oddball vegetables to add to your garden this year. And if you have any questions during the growing season, if you've incorporated in any of these, please let me know. I love to find out when you've done things that I've talked about. Um, or if you have any questions, just you have my email, send me an email. I'll be happy to help. Well, thanks again for talking to us, Rachel. Oh, and no problem. People, people haven't heard this. about it. Rachel and Emily um, and one of our other Master Gardener coordinators have a podcast um, mm -hmm. called Garden Time, spelled like the herb. I always like to listen to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so you much. Are, it's a lot it's of very fun. informal, um, but you can learn a lot. Um, and we'll see everybody um, in two weeks. Thank you, Rachel. And Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Thank right. you. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye.